Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, a free site, bettingangle.us, a free site. Also look us up on dwyerboxingnews.com, a free site. Let's talk about Anthony Joshua versus Francis Ngannou. I'm going to have a little preface first, but let's talk about this fight. But this needs to be said before I go further. The opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, let's have a preface to my comments on the fight. They say the winners write history. Sometimes the winners take time to develop. Inventor Thomas Edison pushed for DC as the standard for electrical current. A financially poorer immigrant, Nikola Tesla, who had the better idea of AC, was somewhat overlooked by history until immigrant Elon Musk decided to name his electric vehicle car company after Tesla, whose work was revisited. Tesla is now recognized by this generation as one of the giants in the field. I've placed a link on the Tesla versus Edison historical battle in the comment section of this video. Now this is a time in the heavyweight division when the best fighter might not have the title. There is a second track in the heavyweight division right now. Let's talk about what I mean. Jack Johnson held the World Colored Heavyweight Champion title from February the 3rd, 1903 to December 26, 1908. He was not considered to be the best in the world, although he might have been. The unbeaten heavyweight champion when Johnson won the colored title was Jim Jeffries, who retired unbeaten in May of 1905. Unappropriately enough, Boxing Day, December 26, 1908, Jack Johnson defeated Tommy Burns in Sydney, Australia, and became the first African American to win the heavyweight championship. Well, understand, while Johnson was the colored heavyweight champion for about five and a half years, he was overlooked. Johnson would later fight the unbeaten Jeffries on July the 4th, 1910 and would beat him. Films of that fight would be banned for years in the United States. Let's talk about another second track. In the welterweight division today, you have a champion who's unbeaten, who I believe is better than Errol Spence. He wants to fight Terence Crawford. In fact... He is probably one of the sport's more talented champions. His name is Jaron Ennis. Yet, as I make this video, he's overlooked. Spence and Crawford won't fight him. There is the possibility that Ennis might have to leave a division in which he arguably is its best fighter. Let me just point out, I think Terrence Crawford is the best pound for pound in the sport. Jaron Annis is also on my short list. Now, perhaps the greatest fighter of them all, Sugar Ray Robinson, would not fight the man behind me, Charlie Burley. Neither would Billy Kahn, who, like Burley, fought out of Pennsylvania. Burley did fight and beat future light heavyweight champion and Hall of Famer Archie Moore. Burley, who fought Ezra Charles twice, was never stopped in 98 matches. Right? He is a Hall of Famer. Now, in my favorites folder here on YouTube is the one fight film that exists of Charlie Burley. He is the man in the dark trunks. As you look at the video, you'll understand the brilliance. Now, you have a second track in the heavyweight division right now. 
The first track has popular, well-known heavyweight champions and former champions. Tyson Fury, Alexander Usyk, Anthony Joshua. But there is another group of heavyweights who, dare I say, might be better. Gamblers need to know about them. They are the betting side of the play. They are the underdogs getting unjustified. Outsized odds as underdogs against the first track fighters. The heavyweight division right now is deep. Folks, it's the deepest I've seen and I've followed the sport for quite a bit. I'm simply not sure if, let's name them, Tyson Fury, Usyk, or Anthony Joshua beats Philippe Ergovic or Gili Zhang. We were about to have an intersection. We were about to have Ergovic against Joshua for the IBF title, right? The IBF will not recognize the Fury Usyk winner as its champion. They want to fight against their mandatory, Philippe Ergovic, right? Just to understand, Ergovic holds the key to the IBF title after the first Fury Usyk fight. Joshua was on the verge of fighting Ergovic for the IBF title. Instead, Joshua has pivoted to fight for big money and a safer payday against Francis Ngannou, a guy fighting in only his second professional boxing match. Now, like the heavyweight division when Jack Johnson held the colored heavyweight championship, you need to be aware of Philippe Ergovic, of Gili Zhang, of the last king of Scotland, Martin Bacoli, who beat Olympic champion Tony Yoka, you also need to be aware of Michael Hunter, who already fought Usyk and gave him one of his best fights. Revisit that fight at Cruiserweight, and who has already beaten Martin Bacoli. Understand, the other day, Gili Zhang said he would beat Daniel Dubois. I agree with him. I would expect that fight to end by knockout. Let's talk about Joshua versus Ngannou, the non-title fight that Joshua has chosen instead of fighting Philippe Ergovic. Now, make no mistake about it. It's a big fight. After Ngannou dropped Tyson Fury, one on one of the judges' scorecards, after landing more power shots than Fury, the honor of boxing is at stake. I'm not kidding. Your MMA friends already believe they have the superior sport. If a guy knocks down the current heavyweight champion, and then follows it up by knocking down or by beating the former heavyweight champion, the boxing community will never hear the end of it. Boxers will look like dilettantes engaged in an inferior sport. Ngannou won't just get a few pages. Rather, he'll get a full chapter in boxing's history books. So Joshua is fighting two fights. One is for the sport of boxing, where he has to defend its honor. You don't do that on your back foot against a newbie. The other is for himself. With Canelo, Anthony Joshua is boxing's box office king. He certainly is the box office king in the heavyweight division. And he's on a mission to get the title again and to clean house. I'm expecting AJ to win this fight by stoppage. And Ganu, as I've said, is only in his second professional boxing match. He simply doesn't have anything close to AJ's boxing experience. 
Also, this is a different fight for Nganu than the Fury fight. Unlike Fury, AJ is a blessed puncher. Not everyone is. Not even some of the elite heavyweights. There is a much smaller margin of error for Nganu in this fight. Nganu can't stay near AJ like he did Fury. I think his feeling in the Fury fight was that he could take Fury's punch. He was going to push Fury to trade with him. He's close enough to Fury and he's loading up to the point where he lands more power punches in the match. By contrast, and I mean this, you don't want to trade with Anthony Joshua. He is simply too gifted a puncher. We know that Nganu has an impressive left hook. He dropped Fury with it. Joshua now has the benefit of looking at the Fury film. He'll be prepared for that left hook from the opening bell. AJ right now is also sharp. Having fought three times in 2023, winning all three, including the last two by stoppage. He'll take the fight seriously. I'm unsure whether Tyson Fury did. But the most important dynamic I see is that to beat AJ, you need to either have a great jab. Think Klitschko, think Dillian White, who both lost to AJ. I believe George Foreman and Sonny Liston would beat AJ because in part they had two of the best jabs I've ever seen. Right? They would jab their way in and then outwork AJ in the pocket, in my opinion. Another path to beat AJ, and I'm not saying there's that many. AJ's a talented fighter. AJ still has a shot at the Hall of Fame. But another way to beat AJ is movement with feints and a back foot. Think Alexander Usyk. Right? You have to understand spacing. You have to understand how to get AJ, who I've called a big and clunky heavyweight, leaning in certain directions. What I want people to do here, too, is to revisit the Prevetkin fight. I know history doesn't remember that fight the way I do. I understand. The judges gave AJ many of the early rounds. I don't dispute that. I would dispute the scoring... I would say that Prevetkin is actually having his way in the fight. Being outside, Prevetkin's an ambush fighter. He's a heavyweight version of Jamel Charlo. He's outside. He jumps inside. When he jumps inside and catches AJ by surprise, he has the opportunity to get off at least a couple of hard shots before jumping back outside. You'll notice in that film, AJ cannot match Prevetkin's foot speed. Nor can AJ match Prevetkin's hand speed. Right? But AJ is able to catch Prevetkin. This, this changes the fight. He catches Prevetkin as Prevetkin is on the way in and life changes. Prevetkin hits the canvas. As did a faster-handed Andy Ruiz. Right now, Ruiz gets up. AJ comes in the pocket. AJ deep in the pocket, although he looked magnificent against Otto Wallen. AJ deep in the pocket is not, in my opinion, Sonny Liston, who I consider to be one of the most talented heavyweight champions in history, although he had a very short reign, from in the pocket. Right? Um, Ali and Leotis Martin. Both beat Liston by being outside and jumping in, right? Ali, of course, has the mobile jab. Leotis Martin is one of Ring Magazine's 100 hardest punchers in boxing history. But understand, in the pocket, Liston's able to dismantle 
pocket-centric fighters like Cleveland Williams. Right? Let me just point out to, has to be said, peak Ali is Ali against Cleveland Williams. Ali, of course, is outside the pocket and catches Williams as he comes in the pocket. Right? Well, just understand, AJ knocks down Andy Ruiz, then makes the mistake of coming in the pocket and staying in the pocket against Andy, who had faster hands. So you need, in my opinion, to beat AJ. Either that jab that can keep AJ off of you. Right? Vladimir Klitschko, after getting knocked down, gets up, drops AJ. That fight hung in the balance until AJ hits him with an uppercut. Right? Dillian White, short fight, White loses, White looks bad. At the end of the fight, what I want people to do is to look at the first round and look at how White is able to establish tempo with his jab. Right? You need that level of jab to keep an AJ at bay while you come in the pocket and hit him with big time shots. Right? AJ's a great puncher. I don't consider AJ to be a great boxer. Right? Just understand, Aliston is a great boxer who was also a puncher. By the way, Liston smaller than Usyk. Right? Alexander Usyk, who I think is going to give Tyson Fury all he can handle was too mobile and too advanced for AJ. I consider Usyk to be a great boxer, right? You see the lateral movement. You see him fainting AJ out of his shoes. AJ cannot control where he is. You see the cat and mouse game in their second fight, where it looks like AJ has hurt Usyk. Usyk turtles, he covers up, AJ jumps in and throws a lot of punches. This is his moment to end the fight. We later find out that Usyk wasn't that hurt. He couldn't have been because how does he then dominate the next round? We find out that Usyk does get hit with some shots, sees AJ open up, and then th is able to think to himself, okay, AJ's opening up, let me just cover up. I know this guy is going to try to hit me in the head, so let me put my hands up like this. Right? Let's just say AJ isn't James Tony. He's not going to take that extra step deep in the pocket and then start taking out your body, leaning on you, working you over. Right? Boxing is different than punching. Well, I, I want people to think about the sport of basketball right now, right? I often think about baseball when I'm analyzing boxing. Put differently, you need to be a point guard or a shooting forward, right? Or a shooting guard. You need to be Jordan or LeBron to be AJ, who's really a power forward. Right? That's his natural game. AJ isn't nimble enough. And I know I'm being critical here. I know the AJ crowd is going to let me have it. That's fine. Free speech will win the day here on my site. But I believe you need to show that you have more coordination than AJ. Then you need to have specific boxing skills. Right? You either have to be able to jab your way in and to the boxing press, let me just say, George Foreman is still alive. If you don't believe me that Foreman has one of the best jabs in boxing, just look at the film. I hope someone tracks down George Foreman and asks him how he would fight AJ. I believe Foreman, who is a protege of Sonny Liston's, would come in behind that jab, right? Foreman in his prime would come in behind that jab, 
would want to trade with AJ, as crazy as that sounds, thinking that he has the skill advantage in the pocket. Folks, Ngannou doesn't have that jab. If someone talks to Usyk about his strategy against AJ, and we won't get the unvarnished truth for years. You know, guys in the moment don't want to give away their trade secrets. Usyk would probably talk about the fact that, you know, AJ wasn't ready to fight a southpaw at that time, right? Might be now. Valen was a southpaw in his last fight, and I thought AJ looked magnificent. Right? But Usyk probably knew when AJ was going to throw punches by his feet. Right? AJ plants his front foot. Usyk moves. That's what movers do. Right? Takes the sting out of the punch. If AJ's feet are raised, Usyk probably is jumping in with all kind of shots. Also, it's AJ who was unsure of himself at the time. He's going through trainers every few months. Right? He doesn't really fight out of a crouch until the second fight. Right? Usyk, I'm sure, figured out AJ's punch pattern. He understood. AJ has an uppercut. I'm not going to lean over the pocket. Right? The one he hits Klitschko with. I'm not going to lean over the pocket. Right? AJ, who has a great left hook. I'll concede AJ has a great left hook. He was afraid to throw it against the southpaw. Let's just call it as it is, right? Clearly, you have to look out for AJ's straight right hand. But here again, Usyk's the guy who can faint you out of throwing the right hand. Folks, Ngannou doesn't have that part of his game, right? Ngannou, you know, again, in basketball terms, with AJ, you need to be able to stay outside the lane. You need to be able to move around the court. Nganu does not have the movement of an Usyk. And in terms of hand speed, and I thought Nganu, you know, has decent hand speed. He does. But he doesn't have top end hand speed. Right, Andy Ruiz, as I've said here for years, even today, has the fastest hands in the heavyweight division. Right, if you don't have that jab to blind a guy so you can come with the right hand behind it, if you're relying on hand speed, I believe you need better hand speed than Nganu has. Right, so understand what I think is going to happen here. And Ganu was able to follow Fury. Right, and Ganu was able to get into the pocket. And he was able to land big shots on Fury. And Ganu is a professional athlete, right? I'm saying his second professional boxing match. The truth of it is that he was the UFC champion. You can't come in and grab Nganu and turn him physically. Right? When Tyson Fury leans forward and tries to ragdoll Nganu like he did Steve Cunningham, like he's going to try to do to Usyk, Nganu had the upper body strength to move off of him. Right? To push him off of him. Not to be pushed backward. Right? Food for thought. Now, in this fight, I believe Nganu is going to make the mistake of trying to trade with Joshua without having that Vladimir Klitschko, that Dillian White, that George Foreman, that Sonny Liston level of jab. Folks, that's a recipe for disaster. Let me just say, too, that I believe AJ does better when you come at him, right? AJ, deep down, although he looked great in his last fight and was the bully in his last fight, but AJ isn't that George Foreman level of bully. 
right? AJ is more like Larry Holmes. If you come at AJ and AJ has to defend himself, that's when AJ, who can shorten his punches, who probably throws the best assortment of heavy shots. There's a moment in the Otto Wallen fight where AJ starts throwing a right hand to Wallen's head after he establishes it to the body. It's sudden. It's heavy. It breaks Wallen's nose. You understand that you're dealing with a George Foreman level of puncher. And understand, Foreman would lock his elbows and turn his whole body into it. AJ is faster hand speed wise than George Foreman. Right? The problem Nganu is going to have is as long as AJ, who in my opinion has the better legs than Nganu, as long as AJ gets the sequence right, he should be able to focus and block Nganu's left hook. And because AJ is two handed, with an uppercut, with body shots, with harder punches, in my opinion, than Nganu, who's known to be a hard puncher. I believe if they trade, AJ wins the fight by stoppage. Let me go one step further. And let me point out that politically, AJ has to win the fight by stoppage. AJ cannot be back foot in this fight. I know this sounds preposterous when I'm talking about one of boxing's most popular fighters. And that's who AJ is. Right? Life's unfair. People love AJ. But I need for people to understand that boxing is an expectation game. Wilt Chamberlain put it best. One of my favorite athletes. He said, no one roots for Goliath. In a fight between a two-time heavyweight champion with AJ's knockout percentage and a guy in his second pro fight with no knockouts, AJ is Goliath, right? If the fight is close, I want AJ to study the uh, George Foreman fight well, forget the guy's name he fought. This is the problem with live videos. But it's the uh, fight that led to Foreman's um, retirement, his first retirement from the sport of boxing, Jimmy Young. Right, folks, that fight's a close fight. But Foreman was viewed as Goliath. It was Young who was exceeding expectations. Right, so not surprisingly, and I know Young knocks down Foreman in the uh, last round, but you and I know Young didn't really beat Foreman by any kind of margin. AJ is up against a situation where if this is a 12-round fight, and this analysis assumes a 12-round fight, not a 10-round fight like the Fury fight. If it's a 12-round fight, and if Nganu is still standing at the end of the 12 rounds, and if Nganu has landed a healthy amount of power shots like he did against Tyson Fury. I'm just telling you because there are people out there who believe Nganu got jobbed by the Tyson Fury decision. Because the feeling is that if you are a current or former heavyweight champion, you're supposed to impose superior skill on a guy in his second pro fight or first pro fight, AJ needs to realize that if he's on his back foot and it's close, I believe the judges are going to job him. Right? So AJ needs to make the kind of statement that he made against Otto Wallen. Now that statement was primarily with straight rights to Valen's body, right? What he needs to do is, as Nganu tries to come close to him, every time Nganu switches to southpaw, 
AJ needs to use that opportunity to go to Nganu's body. Right? AJ needs to charge him, as Teddy Atlas likes to say, for the real estate as Nganu comes in the pocket. The bet I like here is AJ simply AJ by KO. That's the bet I like here. Anthony Joshua by KO. The politics don't allow him in my opinion, to win by decision. I'll hedge the play with the underdog simply to win because I'm sure on the Nganu side of the play, you're going to get outsized odds. But I need for folks to understand the risk involved. If this fight goes the distance like both Usyk fights went the distance, like the Jermaine Franklin fight went the distance, Right? Those are three of AJ's last five fights. You lose it all. I'm expecting Anthony Joshua because Nganu doesn't have that sledgehammer jab. Because Nganu doesn't have that great movement. Because Nganu doesn't have Andy Ruiz combination punching hand speed. That Ray Leonard type of hand speed. I'm expecting Baganu, uh, Nganu to get knocked out because AJ has more talent as well as vastly more experience. I like AJ by stoppage here. That's how I'm playing it. I'm hedging it with the underdog simply to win the fight. If Nganu's left hook is all that, if Nganu has a right hand that he didn't have to show in the Tyson Fury fight, and if he catches Anthony Joshua and drops Joshua. And let's remember, Joshua hits the canvas against Klitschko. Joshua hits the canvas. Uh, looks bad when he gets up, by the way. Joshua hits the canvas against Andy Ruiz. Right? If Nganu is able to drop Joshua, then that's a lot more beer for us. But I'm expecting Joshua to win the fight by stoppage. Also, pay close attention to the number of rounds. I thought Tyson Fury was at risk of losing his title until the ninth and 10th rounds of his fight against Nganu, who looked gassed to me, who looked tired to me, right? With two more rounds, I would have expected Fury to stop a tired Nganu. Now, that's not the way the press sees it, but I didn't get the feeling Nganu was prepared to go 12 rounds against Tyson Fury. Right? If this is a 10-round fight, disregard this video. I'm assuming it's a 12-round fight. That's another feather in Joshua's hat. Because keep in mind, Joshua gets the late stoppage against Klitschko. He goes 12 rounds in both Usyk fights. He goes 12 rounds against Joseph Parker and never gets dropped. Right? Wins that fight does much better than Deontay Wilder did. Right? Food for thought. Also, I like how sharp Joshua is right now. If this fight gets postponed for any reason, right now it's set for March, according to reports. If it gets postponed to September or October, that would take a little bit away from Joshua's chances of winning the fight. Because right now, Joshua looks very sharp. Any delays could dampen that sharpness somewhat. If a delay happens, we'll make a follow-up video here on YouTube. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this YouTube video. Thanks for stopping by.